The drama series Vikings tells the story of one man's meteoric rise from simple farmer to Viking king. Inspired by both legend and history, the show portrays the brutality and the humanity of the Vikings. But where does myth end and fact begin? This series is a journey of discovery across eight countries with the world's top Viking experts and members of the Vikings cast to reveal who the Vikings really were. In this episode, the story of the Viking invasions of Europe. Why do the Vikings start to do what they do? The secret of the Viking longboat. They could hit hard, and there wasn't an awful lot that people on land could do to stop them. A country ripe for plunder. <laughs> and an empire on the brink of collapse. If you wanted an event that had sort of a similar impact, it would have to be something like 9-11. <laughs> Michael Hurst is the creator and writer of the drama Vikings. I've always been interested in Vikings. Most little boys are interested in Vikings, I think. And uh, I still remember the day that my father brought home a little Viking model. I started to do a little research, and I found them fascinating. Their culture, their, their social habits, and their pagan gods. Vikings is based on the legend of Ragnar Lothbrok and his band of raiders in the Age of Invasion. I've always said that the stories and the scripts begin with real events, with real people, with real things, but then I have to join them together. I have to make narrative roads as authentically and logically as possible. Forgive me if I do not uh, kiss your hand. But where does fact meet fiction in the story of the Vikings? And what do we really know about the Viking invasions that transformed Europe and cemented the legend of the Norsemen? <laughs> Actor Clive Standen plays the war chief Rollo, a real-life Viking who was part of the wave of invasions that touched every corner of Europe and beyond. We imagine them as these, these horned helmet devil monsters who came from the sea on their longboats and raided their way through Britain. Nice! We're not trying to say that they didn't do any of these questionable things. It's more that history was recorded by the invaded, as opposed to the, the invaders, because the Vikings were very much illiterate. They didn't write anything down. Neil Price has devoted his career to understanding the real Vikings through archaeology, unraveling myth from history, and drilling down on the forces that pushed them out into the world in the first place. One of the most fundamental questions of Viking studies is, why do the Vikings start to do what they do? Why does the Viking Age, as we conceive it, begin? What is it that pushes these people out from Scandinavia? Was it the climate? Was the weather and the, the environmental conditions in Scandinavia worsening? Was it something to do with the internal power struggles? Were some people pushed abroad as, as exiles? That's certainly a factor in this, but not the only one. One of them is undoubtedly technological. The development of improved shipping techniques, shipping construction, that quite simply makes these things possible. The construction is different. It's built with a strong central plank. Do you think it could handle long sea voyages? <laughs> That's why I'm building it. In the drama Vikings, the character of Floki is the master builder of a revolutionary new kind of ship. <laughs> I told you I could do it! <laughs> and it's a radical new approach to shipbuilding, one that the real Vikings mastered that propelled them out of Scandinavia and ignited the Age of Invasion. 
The classic Viking ship is a masterpiece of design. It can cross the open sea, but also go up the rivers. It has a sail that's perfectly adapted to those kinds of circumstances. It's very maneuverable. It's quick to take down. And this means that the crew can switch from sail power to oar power in a very short space of time. It's a very formidable weapon. In the late 1950s, near Roskilde, Denmark, archaeologists discovered five amazingly well-preserved Viking ships in the frigid waters of a nearby fjord. Now, they're the models for a growing fleet of replica ships, built by hand the old way and using the very same materials they did in the Viking Age. <laughs> Today, 60 volunteer sailors are putting the sea stallion through her paces to see what can be learned about Viking seamanship. Archaeologist Ben Raffield specializes in the warrior culture of the Norsemen, and he's come to Roskilde to see for himself how the longship helped transform the Vikings into the most feared warriors of the Middle Ages. In my own research, I'm interested in the kind of social aspects of generally of the Viking Age, but especially in situations involving uh, warfare and conflict. <laughs> So it's actually the, the crew coming together as, as well as the technology just, just to make sure that you know, you're getting the most out of the ship at any one time. Yeah, both in terms of speed, but also in terms of safety. It's really important that everybody is working together. Actually experiencing this, you really get an idea of how spending fairly long amounts of time in a in confined space like this, how it really brings together a group of people. They had to rely upon each other as sailors and as fighters. I think all those things helped establish significant social unity that made them somehow even more powerful. Sail down! The idea of becoming a strong unit. Once you hit the beach, and you want to fight with the enemy, then these things, in my opinion, become really vital in, in staying together, becoming a unit, and, and, and fighting together. In the late 790s, small bands of heavily armed raiders crashed down on the coast of England. When the Vikings arrive in England at the very in the sort of late 780s, early 790s, what's happening is they're coming into a world that's completely different from their own. There are these little monasteries scattered, usually in very isolated, out-of-the-way places. So here we are in the chancel of modern-day St. Paul's Church, which is still a working church. Uh, 1,300 years after its foundation and was actually the, the first building to be built here when the monks arrived. Don't be afraid. Trust in God and let us pray. What would it have looked like in here back then? The walls would have been whitewashed and it would have been very highly decorated. This is the very site that a very well-known Viking raid took place 1,200 years ago. We at Philly, at Spiritus Sancti, Pater Noster Quiescens. The Viking raiders would have entered the church, perhaps to find uh, the cowering monks terrified for their lives. It's these things that the Viking raiders would have wanted to get their hands on. Of course, they weren't Christian, so they weren't being respectful to these uh, very sacred relics. 
to the Anglo-Saxons, so they would have pillaged the place and took whatever they could get their hands on. And to them, it, it's just a complete culture clash. It's extraordinary that they turn up somewhere where there is a huge amount of movable wealth. The idea that these non-Christians were coming and so easily destroying and taking things that were so sacred to the Anglo-Saxons, that there would have been perhaps some fear and also disbelief that this was actually taking place. <laughs> During the Viking raids in the late 8th century, England is slowly climbing out of the Dark Ages, fragmented and vulnerable. Effendator remissionem peccatorem. In northern England, just outside modern-day Newcastle, Bede's World is a reconstructed Anglo-Saxon village that transports visitors back to the medieval era. So the buildings on the farm are based on excavated sites okay. from um, sites throughout mm -hmm. Northumberland. And they've all been reconstructed using Anglo-Saxon tools, Anglo-Saxon techniques. What's going on in Anglo-Saxon England, you know, on the eve of the Viking Age, England didn't exist, really. It didn't, no. Britain was mm. broken up into a number of different kingdoms, all of which had their own rulers, and the borders were constantly changing. So, you know, these weren't actually often friends. There was a fair amount of conflict going on between them uh, at times. That's right. There's certainly no centralised force within Britain at this time. Shame! No! Shame on you! In the drama series, and in the real history of Anglo-Saxon Britain, at the beginning of the ninth century, Eckbert is one of seven kings vying for control of England, even before there was an England. The character of King Egbert in the drama series is the viewer's kind of point of contact to Anglo-Saxon England, its politics, its culture. And many of the things that are depicted in, in his court are absolutely uh, accurate reflections of the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms and how they related to each other and to their past. Egbert was to be the king of England, and he really plants the seed of this idea that there will be a country called England, and it will have a ruling family, and that ruling family will pass power down from generation to generation. That's a completely new idea. different Anglo-Saxon kingdoms all have their own agendas that are meshing together. Sometimes they conflict, sometimes they run in parallel. If you and I join together, not only against the Northmen, but also against Mercia, we should surely overcome it. Let us drink to our alliance. Egbert enjoys power. He enjoys using power for larger and better ends. He believes, and I'm sure this is true, that if you could uh, unite the English kingdoms under one authority, England would be better able to defend itself against Vikings. Inside the British Library in London, historian Claire Downham has uncovered remarkable 1,200-year-old documents laying out the plans for the earliest Anglo-Saxon resistance to the Vikings. Tell me about what we have here in front of us. OK, so this is one of a series of uh, charters which come from Christ Church Canterbury. So what we have here is a grant of land which dates to the year 811. It's also referring to uh, the fortification of strongholds mm -hmm. and also um, the building of bridges um, against the pagans. And the, this term, contra paganos, here is the interesting bit because they are clearly being identified as the main threat to the security of this land holding. Um, and the kind of activities there is also indicative of a, a level of military organisation in the face of Viking attacks. We tend to have a, this view of the early uh, part of the Viking Age is, you know, the Vikings coming over and ransacking targets mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. actually Anglo-Saxons not having much of a response, but mm -hmm. they should yeah. be able to actually defend themselves and even mount offensives against these incoming forces. Yeah, exactly. It's showing 
coordinated, organized defense. Just as the Anglo-Saxons switch tactics, so too do the Vikings. They now set their sights on the riches of mainland Europe. Vikings are very practical raiders. They go for the least resistance. If the fighting is too hard, if, if the enemy is too well prepared, they just cross the channel. They go to the other side. For the Vikings, the Frankish Empire represents a, a kind of cornucopia of choice. It's a tremendously rich place and a tremendously tempting target in, in every way. The Vikings are about to unleash hell on Francia, the superpower of the Middle Ages. Then! <laughs> When we think of the Viking raids and how they begun, there's, there's no sense in which the Vikings are heading out into an unknown world. They know exactly what's out there. And really, their attention is principally south into the Frankish Empire, one of the great superpowers of the time, with its markets, its towns. So there's really an embarrassment of riches for them to choose from. Today, the city of Aachen is in Western Germany. But in the 8th and 9th centuries, it was the site of one of the greatest courts in the ascendant Frankish Empire. And no star burned more brightly than the mighty Charlemagne, who ruled the Franks from the year 800 until his death in 814. Charlemagne creates around him renaissance in art, in literature. He creates a, a really a glittering court, a court that by, by the standards of someone like Ecbert arriving from Wessex is just awe-inspiring. There are buildings that are made of stone. There are palaces that are 500 meters wide. We're about to walk into the presence of Charlemagne himself. We are. Perhaps the most famous image of Charlemagne from the Middle Ages, a piece of his skull in there. The year is 814, and finally Charlemagne is dead. We're standing here in front of his, his coffin, a reused Roman sarcophagus fit for an emperor. Mm. And things really start to go wrong. After Charlemagne's death, internal rivalries soon plunge Francia into a state of civil war. In true Viking fashion, Francia's crisis becomes the Norsemen's opportunity. Once again, they prepare to raid. One of the things that makes the Frankish Empire intensely vulnerable is water. If you look at the main centers of Frankish power, they're situated on rivers. But for the Vikings, they're nothing less than motorways. They take them quickly, directly to the heart of things. And so they see an open goal, really, where they can start raiding with greater impunity, traveling further up the rivers, traveling further inland. And it's very clear that this is entirely deliberate on the part of the Vikings. Mm -hmm. they, they fully understand the Carolingian weakness, they, they understand its cause, and they can see in that power vacuum exactly where to strike. After Charlemagne's death, the Vikings sack Aachen Cathedral. These doors are actually the doors that have stood there since Charmin's time. These are 1,200-year-old doors. 1,200 years old. 1,200 years old. It's quite extraordinary to stand here in modern-day Aachen and see exactly what the Vikings would have seen. Took what they could. That was the thing about being a Viking. You took your plunder, you took your loot, you took it back home. But these things, well, well, they you wouldn't can't... fit in your hand luggage, would they? No. So. And you, would you sink your boat with one of these? Do you think? I don't know. You certainly wouldn't uh, fit two of them on a, like, a Viking longship. And that's probably why they're still here today, because they're far too big to take away with you. If you were a Scandinavian who came here, the idea was it would blow your socks off. You'd be so impressed. The other jewel in the crown of Frankish cities is Paris. With the nobility fighting amongst themselves for control, it had never been more vulnerable or more attractive to the restless Viking raiders. 
Tell me about Paris. It was amazing. I have never in my whole life seen anything like it. It was like a dream. And churches, such churches. In the third season of the drama series, this is what Ragnar starts to plug into. He, he hears about Paris, this, this fabled city. In, in his terms, perhaps the ultimate target. It's a draw. I've made up my mind. And this year, we shall attack Paris. Paris! Historical records from the time describe Ragnar as a leader of the siege. So this, this will not For Ragnar to hear that there are such places which are almost beyond imagining, of course, stimulates him and, and interests him. The Viking attacks on the Franks, on the Empire, provide an opportunity for material gain, for loot and wealth. But there are other things just as important to the Vikings, and that is the opportunity to increase their status, to increase their fame, perhaps almost as a kind of religious act. There is, in the Viking psyche, this belief that your fate has been decided at your birth. All you can do is hope that the gods have a, a heroic death in battle planned for you, because a best Viking death is to die in battle. That way you go to Valhalla. So Paris is a, is a, is a good place to go if you, if you fancy going to Valhalla. <laughs> Paris in the year 845. The splendors of the royal court of King Charles are legendary. For Viking raiders on a constant prowl for fresh plunder, it's an irresistible urge. Not only is Paris a very valuable target to attack, it is a famous target to attack. It speaks volumes. So if you can go there and attack them there, it does say, I have a free hand. I can do what I like, wherever I like. Sailing south by southeast, we come upon the mouth of the Seine, the gateway to Paris. Here is the entrance. The entrance to paradise. Starting as early as 810, Viking raiders begin terrorizing the northern coast of Francia. It's the beginning of a century of invasions deep into the heart of continental Europe. In the drama series, Ragnar's attack on Paris is very much the Vikings' first contact with the Empire. But of necessity, this is very much a, a compression, for dramatic reasons, of what is actually decades of escalating Viking attacks. In Wazelle, in northern France, archaeological evidence of Viking camps have been found along the Seine River. Actor Clive Standen, who plays Rollo in the drama series, has come to Rouen to see where real Vikings lived and fought. There's actually relatively few numbers of really Scandinavian finds from this region. And this is why we've come here to the Museum of Antiquities in Rouen and to see their, their collections here. So, Nicola, could you talk us through a little bit of what we, we see on the table? So I've got here a little selection of Viking items from our collections. So, first of all, this food here has been excavated in Normandy uh, during the 19th century from Wassel, uh, which was a very famous and important uh, winter camp for the Viking on the Seine River. And if you look uh, closer to the knob, you can see this semicircular shape, and it's a typical Viking shape for a sword. It's amazing, actually, you have to have them out. And, and to Do you want to handle this sword? <laughs> we, we can be cautious <laughs> about that, but... OK, so just put one in here now. Wow. Right. Oh. Now, this is something yep. that you don't get to do every day. So it's very light. It is light, but it must be just because it's corroded so much mm -hmm. as well. Yep. Continuing their relentless move upriver from their camps on the Seine, the Vikings seem unstoppable. More than a thousand years after the last Viking longships ravaged the Seine, echoes of the terror that was the Norsemen can still be felt. Archaeologist Gareth Williams is an expert on Viking battle strategies. 
one of the things that's hard to imagine today is just how terrifying it would be to see an entire fleet coming up the river. That dragon head prow comes around the corner, and then another, and then another, and then another. We hear accounts of hundreds of ships in a fleet able to divert quickly to either bank, attack to either side, seizing the opportunity. They could hit hard, and they could hit fast, and there wasn't an awful lot that people on land could do to stop them. Lying between the Vikings and Paris is the Abbey of Saint-Denis, one of the holiest sites in all of Francia. This is the resting place of the Frankish kings. It's also the keeping place of holy relics, saints' bones. This is a, a, a tremendously holy place and a symbolic place as well that, that the, the emperor wants to hold at all costs. I, exactly. I, I think quite apart from any loss of plunder and riches from the sack of a place like this, it's a symbolic blow to the kingdom if, if somewhere like this is seen to fall. So the, the Frankish emperor, emperor is, is using this as his command center. This is where he's, he's gathering his troops outside Paris in advance of the, the Viking attack. When Ragnar attacks in Mercia in the series, that's based entirely on an account of the Vikings attacking on the Seine, where Charles rather foolishly puts half his army on one side of the river and half on the other. The battle that takes place here is, at that time, the, the greatest confrontation that has been between the, the Franks and the Vikings. By this stage, we're told 120 ships sailing up the Seine. That could easily be a force of 5,000 men, um, and similar numbers, if not greater, on the Frankish side. So it's a real battle. Concentrate the full attack on the right bank. Hard steel board! There was two armies on opposite banks of the river, and we have Ragnar just deciding that, well, obviously I'll go and attack this small army, and not only do I stand a better chance of beating them, but the army on the other side will see me do it. Franks expected that when there was a battle, you lined up and you fought each other. That was the sort of decent thing to do. The Vikings didn't do that. They capture 111 people, and they hang them on an island in the middle of the Seine in front of the other army. The other army, at this point, not surprisingly, runs away. They come across with the heads hanging from their ships. And fear is, is just as good a weapon as a sword, and Vikings were very happy to use that whenever they could. You wanted an event that had sort of a similar impact to the Vikings attacking Paris in, in the modern world. It would have to be something like 9-11, where you have a group of people who are prepared to do something that is simply unthinkable, that don't play by your rules. Both sides lose many people, but Charles is left in possession of Saint-Denis. But by taking his stand there, he had, of course, left Paris wide open. With the collapse of the Franks at Saint-Denis, the way to Paris is clear. Stegen! The siege of Paris is about to begin. Stegen! 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 We're floating in the middle of the Seine. If we were the Vikings, we'd have come down the coast all the way, following the coastline of Europe down from Scandinavia and into the mouth of the river here. And we know that by the time they'd got all the way here to the outskirts of Paris, the Vikings had been fighting a number of engagements as they proceeded up the river. That's right. They had to fight their way past a number of towns and through hostile countryside all the way. There are so many Viking vessels on the Seine that it looks like a river of wood that you could cross from one bank to the other on the decks of the ships. Oh. 
The year is 845 as the Viking fleet masses at the walls of Paris. The city was defended by enormous Roman walls, none of which unfortunately survive today. And that's why we're here in Le Mans, precisely because the walls of this city do survive and they give us just about the best chance we've got of seeing what Paris's defenses would have looked like. When you stand down here, you really do appreciate just how formidable these fortifications are. Yes, I wouldn't want to have to get up there in a hurry, especially not with people throwing things down on my head. If we think of this as Paris, what we're looking at is, is the Seine out here, um, the, the ships right up against the base of the wall, which we know came down to the water. These really are very impressive fortifications. Very high, very thick, solid, a very daunting obstacle to any Viking force attacking. Fly! They have to get up the wall, presumably with scaling ladders or some other device, but certainly ladders. All the while, people are raining all kinds of stuff down on them from the parapet. Archery is a very important part of these sieges, isn't it? Yes, very much so. The defenders up here would have the advantage of gravity, firing downwards that have a greater range, greater penetrating power. And with towers like this, every 50 feet or so, those enable to shoot across the gaps. So from here, you can really only attack directly downwards. But from the towers, you've got crossfire as well. If they manage to get up the ladder, which is a, a, a difficult enough undertaking, sooner or later, they're going to appear there on the edge. And facing them are a number of very angry Franks who want to prevent that. And this is where all the other close quarter weapons come into play. A very, very bloody affair, indeed. Outnumbered and overwhelmed, the Frankish army is crushed. The city plundered. But it doesn't end there. Forty years later, the Vikings are back on the Seine. And this time, at least one historic record puts Rollo among the leaders. The wonderful thing about the 885 siege of Paris is we have a really, an unusually good account of it written by uh, a monk called Abbo Conius who lived just outside the city. And he's present, he's there, and he records in detail what happens. So we did take some elements of this fantastic account. After the disastrous siege of 845, the Franks have built a series of defensive bridges designed to stop the Vikings. You look at a bridge like this and a modern bridge, it's designed to allow boats to come underneath it easily. That's exactly what these bridges were not designed to do. They'd be much lower. They might even have blockages across to stop anything getting under at all. And if you did come under, you'd come underneath you don't need trained soldiers to drop rocks onto a wooden boat. So in 885, the focus of the campaign is on the bridges to stop the Viking fleet from passing Paris and continuing on up the river. Yes, well, fire would have been an important weapon in siege at that time. <laughs> Although the walls were stone, most of the buildings inside exactly. would have been timber. The bridges would have been largely timber. <laughs> this time, the city holds fast. It holds strong, despite being massively outnumbered. At the end, they simply fight themselves to a standstill. 
And the rather anticlimactic end of the siege is that the Franks simply pay the Vikings to go away. So both sides, in a way, get what they want. The, the Franks have their city intact. The Vikings have their reward. But as the drama series shows, not all the Vikings go away. Historic records reveal that Rollo continues raiding for more than 20 years. When we get to Rollo, get a more sophisticated Viking than the just, uh, I'm going to sack your monastery and I'm going to threaten you until you pay me to go away. He's someone who wants more. The drama series character of Rollo is one of the most famous Vikings of history. Absolutely a real person. Rollo is his English name. It comes from the French Roland. This is a man who has been on decades of Viking raids. The biggest artistic license we took with the TV show Vikings is to make Ragnar and Rollo brothers in the show because they, they weren't related in any way and actually lived many decades apart. But they're two fantastic characters in Viking history and what better way than to, to blend the stories in one TV show than to make them siblings. We are brothers. You and I will always be equal. Rolo could have just been a jealous brother. My brother. And I remember saying to Clive uh, early in the process, I said, you'll never guess that in the end, you're probably the most successful of them all. Desperate to stop the Vikings, the Frankish king offers Rollo a deal in the year 911. You will be offered a vast area of land in the northern part of Francia. The emperor will also make you a duke, the highest honor he can bestow. You will be very rich and you will be very important. What must I do in the return? Neil Price and Gareth Williams have arrived at the august French National Archives to see what records remain of the Frankish king's attempt to buy peace with Rollo. So, what we have here is one of the very early documentary records of the granting of land to Vikings in France. Yeah. Yes, it's a charter of the Frankish king, Charles the Simple. It's from 918. There's Rollo himself, together with his companion Northmen for the defense of the kingdom. And that's really the point of this settlement. It's effectively setting a thief to catch a thief, putting Vikings at the mouth of the Seine to stop other Vikings coming up the river. That grant of land is made at the mouth of the Seine because that is the point of access ultimately to Paris. If we settle Vikings there, they can stop other Vikings from getting into the river. 1,100 years after it was signed, this extraordinary document is the only remaining record of Rollo agreeing to a settlement. What we're seeing is the essence of Rollo's transformation, actually, from, from a, a, a pagan Viking raider to what he would later become. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Shortly after, Amen. the one-time Viking warlord becomes a Christian convert. He gets land, he gets power, he gets status, and above all, he minimizes the risk. He gets all of these things without fighting anymore. Rollo would go on to rule a large part of northern France for close to 20 years. Today, that region is known as Normandy, or the land of the Norsemen. Rollo, c'est vos salut. J'avoue, salut. And here we are. Here he is. Rollo himself. And this is why we've come to, to Rouen Cathedral. This is the, uh, the heart of Normandy. It's the place where Rollo was baptized and, and here he is, his, his burial place. We have every reason to believe that his bones really are in here. 
an incredible moment for me because I remember coming here when I was about 11 years old on a school trip. And I would have had no idea that, you know, this would have been full circle and I'd be playing this character. And this also marks a, a, a different kind of full circle for, for Rollo. At the end of his life, he, he's a, a Christian ruler of a Christian duchy and, and buried here in this you know, magnificent cathedral. I never forgive myself if I didn't touch him. Incredible. The Viking invasions don't end with the death of the mighty Rollo. For the next 150 years, the Vikings carve a path of conquest and plunder across Europe. And their legacy will last much longer. In the next century, Rollo's descendant, William the Conqueror, will become the King of England. I just am very proud of the fact that this is as authentic as we can make it. It's done in the belief that the Vikings were and are incredibly interesting. Vikings is one of the few words that's universal, and it brings to everyone's mind the same visceral imagery, the same sense of their awesomeness. The first scene of the series was meant to remind people of the cliché of Viking warriors. That is, their fighting ability, their brutality. However, that was then juxtaposed against the next scene, which was a family scene. Because that was the other big, big aspect for me. To get behind the cliches and to start thinking about them as human beings and to do something that I felt hadn't been done before. The Vikings terrorized Europe for much of 300 years. How did their pagan roots and their social structure nurture a warrior society that was virtually unstoppable? Archaeologist Neil Price is one of the world's leading experts on Viking paganism. There's one factor above all that sets them apart, and it's quite simply their religion. In the drama series, Vikings are depicted in a Dark Ages pagan world before the arrival of Christianity. A time of many gods, when nature and the supernatural are inextricably linked. Those beliefs are not just something that we should think of as chapter five religion in a quick book on the Vikings. They're things that inform every aspect of life. You know who that is, don't you? Of course. This is Thor. Almost everyone has heard of Odin or Thor. But there are actually a great many of Norse gods, some of which we know almost nothing about other than their names. But for the Vikings, the most important aspect of that supernatural world was the invisible population that lived all around them. The elves and the dwarves, the water spirits, the ice spirits, the land spirits. All the citizens that shared their world and with whom they had to maintain good relations. Today, 1,000 miles off the coast of Scandinavia, across the harsh North Atlantic, Iceland is a place where the echoes of the Vikings can still be heard. Actor Clive Standen, who plays Rollo on the Vikings series, has come here to learn more about the spiritual world of the Norsemen. But it's up in the hills here, that's where the, the very spirits would have lived that you would have been dealing with. And when you talk about spirits, you mean trolls? And... I'm talking about the land spirits um, that you, in a sense, have to do a deal with to, to uh, protect your farm, help you, help you with, with daily life to a certain extent. Um, this is a rough landscape to be living in. I'll take you. Folklorist Terry Gunnell has spent his career trying to decipher Norse paganism. When a person thinks of a religion, they tend to think of a religion like Christianity which has a book behind it, a set dogmatic religion. Everybody has to behave the same. You have a, a text for rituals. 
we're dealing with here is religion without a book, a religion that has developed orally over time amongst a whole range of different tribes. In the driving snow of the Icelandic hinterland, Clive Standen is being transported back to the world of the pagans. A small door for what we always imagine to be tall Vikings. Absolutely. <laughs> so, here we have the longhouse as it might have looked originally. Certainly equip yourself with a weapon here. Yeah, I'll keep it. Let me introduce here my colleague, Alaher Goodman's daughter from the University of Iceland. Lovely to meet Lady you. of the house here. And sit in the high seat. Don't mind if I do. So this is, this is the normal sort of setup for the average house, I would say, certainly around Iceland. Quite dark, quite smoky, and quite atmospheric, especially in the winter time. I just really want to know how, how this pagan belief system, how it, how it functioned on a day-to-day -day in one of these farmhouses. The religion was part of everyday life, and even if you're making bread or making beer or something like this, you're going to be calling on local spirits, nature spirits, to be helping you. When the spirits are wandering around outside, everybody's a little bit drunk. There's smoke in the room here, there's firelight lighting up your face. And then suddenly you say something like, um, Fate ek at ek hek, wind gamme the ow. Nightur at la niu, geiri undadur, o given odni, shalver shalvam mir. Suddenly the, the poet is turning himself into Odin. And basically, this is Odin talking about how he has listened to the words spoken in the hall. And the gods are, I mean, they are interesting characters, so people would like to hear stories about the gods. Avrunam, heri daima, ni avraudam thaudu, hauva hudlu at, hauva hudlu i. Gamla Uppsala is an ancient Swedish village one hour north of Stockholm. Underneath its pastoral lands lies a rich but hidden past dating back to the bloody days of the pagans. It's one of the most important ritual centers of Viking Age Sweden. The focal point of Gamla Uppsala is a gravel ridge that runs all the way through the site. It's along this ridge that the, the Vikings and their ancestors built a series of monumental burial mounds. When the Vikings did their rituals, they were walking and doing the rituals in different places in the terrain. In the 11th century, a German monk named Adam of Bremen wrote an account of the temple of Gamla Uppsala and the pagans' shocking rituals. Hail to Valley, Sif, and Heimdall. It's so evocative and vivid in its description of pagan Viking religion. There is a great cultic building, a temple. Inside are great effigies of three gods, which appear to be Odin, Thor, and Freyr. So we look out over the Uppsala Plain, and in the Viking Age, down here, this would have been full of buildings. If there was a temple, most people's best guess is they would be under the church. As Christianity spread across Scandinavia in the Middle Ages, traces of the pagan past were wiped clean from the landscape. Researcher John Lundqvist has brought the prototype for a new digital reconstruction of the site to help visualize the Viking Age world of Gamla Uppsala. Oh, this is very cool indeed. So we're approaching the church, yep. which is the place that almost everyone who's worked with Gamla Uppsala reckons that if there is a temple, if there is some kind of sacred area, it really ought to be centered on the church. This is quite bold, isn't it? You've got a tree instead of a building. And right in the middle is a proper sacrificial offering. A whole horse hanging in the tree. this would be a very, very striking sight, as it was to the Christians who saw it. We know it. They, they were absolutely outraged. Artemis Bremen describes nine bodies of each male species, including humans, hanging in the grove there. What dark past spawned the pagan Vikings? An epic collapse and a culture on the verge of oblivion. In the 6th century, 
300 years before the Viking Age, the people of Scandinavia are mired in the chaos of the Dark Ages. But the pagan gods are no match for the fate that is about to befall them. It's impossible to really get to grips with who the Vikings were, why they came to be, and what they did, without going back in time as far as the, the 6th century. What we see is a period of tremendous turmoil. Things start to really fall apart. Many experts believe a perfect storm of factors very nearly bring the Norsemen to the brink of extinction. People have speculated about famine, disease. Other people think that it is about the destabilizing effect of former mercenaries who had fought for Rome finally coming home and bringing their troubles with them. We find a drastic abandonment of settlements. Whole communities simply left. On Gotland, off the coast of mainland Sweden, all that remains of the Norse village of Valhagar is an empty field turned over to nature. But in the Dark Ages, it is a thriving community of 24 homes, a collection of farms, roads, and even two cemeteries. It's the largest archaeological site from the Iron Age ever found in Northern Europe. One of the things I, I really like about this site is the possibility to get a feel for the landscape. It's a place that lends itself to the imagination. You can repopulate it with the, the voices of the people that lived here. But sometime in the 6th century, these fields are the site of a savage conflict. Valhaga has been completely excavated, so we have the whole village uncovered, and it met a very sad end. Today, a tiny shard of pottery provides a glimpse into a pattern of destruction that was being played out across Scandinavia. And this is very, very typical for this period of time. It's strange with a find like this, it's just a simple piece of pottery, but it, there's a, it tells a very violent story. This has been burnt, isn't it? It's typical of the objects that were in the houses, isn't it? That mm. They show the marks of the fire that, that's yeah. destroyed the buildings. It looks very much as though the village was attacked and never resettled. It, it was yes, abandoned yeah. after that. In this period, we also see abandonment on a wider scale. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, is this going on across Gotland? Yeah, yeah, it is. So at this same time, most of these places are being abandoned. Exactly what happens to cause devastation in Gotland and across Scandinavia remains a mystery. But the path of destruction and death it leaves in its wake paints a picture of a people fighting for their very lives. Things start to collapse in Scandinavian societies. Some scholars have estimated that the population of Scandinavia may drop by half, a 50% death rate. And the reason this is relevant to the time of the Vikings, more than 200 years later, is what came after that collapse? How did people start to rebuild? Oh! As so often happens, after a time of large-scale trauma, some of the solution seems to have been violent. It's a shift to a society in which war is commonplace. In the apocalyptic years of the Dark Ages, Scandinavia becomes a spawning ground for a martial culture, a culture where the values of constant warfare color every aspect of society. We see the rise of true military elites, people who fetishize weapons. They're making a virtue of their warrior identity. This is the new society that is gradually putting itself together. It brings with it the rise of small kingdoms, and then those kingdoms start to expand and fight each other and absorb each other and get bigger and bigger. By the end of the 8th century, the Scandinavians survive, even prosper, by turning their aggression outward onto the rest of an unsuspecting Europe. It's not just foreign lands that bear the brunt of their ferocity. Just as in the drama, a Viking's worst enemy is oftentimes another Viking. Although the raids in Europe have been documented over the centuries, evidence of Viking on Viking battles was missing from the archaeological record. Until recently, Neil Price and fellow researcher Ben Raffield have traveled west of Stockholm to the World Heritage Site of Birka, a once thriving town that disappeared in a dark chapter of Viking history. Their guide is one of the foremost experts on Birka, archaeologist Charlotte Hedenstina Jonsson, 
who has been excavating the site since 1997. We are now on the inside of the town rampart and we're facing at the town area. If we start up where the hill fort, you can see it quite nicely in this light. And just outside the hill fort, that's the garrison. That's where the men that defended the site stayed. In the 10th century, Birka is a heavily fortified settlement with a lucrative trading network stretching as far east as Constantinople, modern-day Istanbul. When Birka starts out in the 750s, it's very much a part of the hinterland. But when you come into the late 9th century, and especially in the 10th century, it's very self-sufficient, and they're extremely wealthy. So now we're entering into the garrison area. This is where the Vikings really are, the Vikings. And you find all the different kinds of weapons. You find everything that has to do with warfare and, and uh, military life. Whatever has happened here has been extremely intense. As in the drama series Vikings, the real Vikings of the 10th century are ready to fight to the death in a world where differences are settled in blood. The battle for Birka is on. Can you walk us through how you think this will happen? Of course. Please. Roll! Roll! We're standing in the foundation of the jetty where they would probably have landed. And the attackers would have come from the waterline. This is where they probably stormed up. First volley of arrows from the waterfront, second from here somewhere. And then up the side. And then, up the side. <laughs> and then there was some kind of fierce battle scene. And then the building is set on fire. Probably during the attack. Artifacts dug out of the ruins of Birka are kept safe in the Swedish History Museum in Stockholm. Here, Charlotte has turned this storage space into something closer to a crime lab, combining modern archaeology with what looks like police forensics. So the first wave of the battle would have been the attack from the waterfront, and you can see that there are lots of arrows in this mm. area of the house. So these are the actual arrows? These are, are the actual the arrows. End. There's armor-piercing arrow. There's the slightly like twisted ones. So you can see it's pointy mm. shape. To punch through armor. This one, it's not pointy. And this is so that it will bleed more. When everything starts to go really, really wrong, we find the big weapons that mm. are broken. <laughs> this is a famous object, because this might very well be the arrow that put the whole garrison area into fire and ended the fight. It's a fire arrow, and if you had burning cloth, you put it in the hole. In an age when power is won by the blade of the axe, no one is safe from attack. Rulers are only as secure as they are ruthless. The Viking system provides for constant instability. I am Jarl Borg of Jota Land, your new ruler. All hail El Kalf! If someone bigger, stronger, uh, brighter turned up, they would take over. Hail El Anything might happen, and usually does, for many reasons. One is the likelihood of dying. Most Viking males were dead by 29. The idea of martial life was everywhere. Warfare is the norm, and there's no peace, it's just war. And the warrior was the ideal. As the Viking menace explodes on the medieval world, their legend as fearless warriors helped carry them on a wave of conquest and plunder. But to truly understand who they are, researchers look to their burial sites and their hidden secrets. If we want to get to the people, who they were, how they wanted to be remembered, how they wanted to be depicted, then graves are the best place to go. In the late 1920s, a team of researchers make a series of remarkable discoveries at an ancient city of the dead near Stockholm called Valsjarda. What excites the archeological community are more than a dozen Viking longboats buried in this hillside. Stretching away from us all along this line is boat after boat after boat, added one per generation. The boats are the graves of men, and between them, in chambers and in cremations, are the graves of women. 
Now we're coming up to grade three, one of the largest of the boats right here. And as we get into this line, we're starting to get into the Viking Age, spreading out along the hill. So this is the length of the boat, really, really quite a, a, an impressive craft. So each of these graves is dug like this, a, a slot carved into the side of the, the hill at a slight incline, the boat dragged up and oriented directly towards the river. So the dead person would be in their resting place, looking out at the river. And on board, everything needed for the passage into the afterlife in Valhalla. It's almost like an avenue in itself of, of the dead, in a way. Absolutely. A unique place. Thousands of artifacts were pulled from the ground at the Valsiata gravesite, covering centuries of Scandinavian history. They are housed here at Uppsala University and are being studied for the first time in 90 years. What you see here is reconstructed shield and the metal mounts are real. You have to imagine that all of these things would be polished, gleaming, uh, uh, an amazing visual display. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we find more than one of these shields in the same grave, um, overlapping one another. So they're, they're one of the last things that are placed into the burial chamber. And as you can see, they, they really are just amazing pieces. In December 2015, Neil Price received funding to catalog and research the artifacts in what could be the biggest advance in Viking studies in generations. Well, the most obvious object of all, the axe. Which is rather massive by any standard, really, isn't Indeed. it? Indeed. This is a heavy fighting axe. It would have had a, a long shaft. This is the kind of axe you use with two hands. And you can see how the edge is much thicker, ranges along here to give you much more impact. This is a battle axe. Mm. This is not your everyday uh, work axe. This is a, a simple, practical, and eminently deadly weapon. There are descriptions that talk about how it could cut down a horse and rider with a single blow from one of these. This is quite literally the symbol of what made the Vikings proper Vikings. Among the other treasures found in Valsjarda is another weapon close to the heart of any Viking warrior. The sword today is, is too fragile to pick up. It's held together by this metal frame that was put onto it decades ago. The detail here is, is absolutely extraordinary. So it's not often you find swords preserved with scabbards still intact. If you're looking close here, we can see the designs carved mm. on the wood of the scabbard. What makes this particular sword so remarkable is a tiny design feature that speaks to the very nature of Viking society. This is called a ring sword for obvious reasons. You have this little ring set into a loop on the side of the pommel. And the ring is a symbol of loyalty. It's a sign that someone has taken an oath, a binding oath, um, to their lord. These arm rings bind you in loyalty to me, your lord, your chieftain. Yes, you show your, um, your power by giving things and receiving things. And, and if I give you something, you have to give me something back. Otherwise, you're indebted to me, and that's terrible. The tradition of the ring sword becomes a time-honored ritual between Viking chieftains and their most powerful and influential warriors. To keep the system of patronage in place, the Viking leaders need a steady supply of portable wealth. This also may be why some of their energies are channeled into raiding, which ensure a constant flow of new goods and services in, into Scandinavian society. Each one of you can take one thing from this hole. Now, all the world can see how magnanimous and generous is your lord. By the time the Viking Age is underway, the military elites and their chieftains have cemented their bonds of loyalty. Now, they are ready to strike out as the medieval world's most deadly and merciless foe. Back from the brink of oblivion. The Vikings of the eighth century are rebuilding their civilization against all odds. And as their communities begin to flourish, they also start trading within Scandinavia and slowly begin to improve their daily lives. 
a big, big aspect for me of going into Viking life and into Viking society was to explore them as human beings. I don't think they've ever been humanized. Facing out onto the North Sea, Kaupang is one of the most important trading centers in all of Scandinavia in its day. Its very name means marketplace in Old Norse. Kaupang is one of these very, very key early towns from, from Scandinavia. It begins around the start of the Viking Age. Archaeologist Steve Ashby has come here to learn more about the everyday Viking life in the 9th century. So we're here at the famous site of Kaupang. Um, what, what was here? What did they find here in the excavations? Um, this was a uh, kind of a small town uh, situated along this, uh, where the sea came in. Today, all that remains of this once thriving community are farmers' fields. But in its day, Kaupang would have been a bustling center of close to a thousand Vikings and their families. So this was a planned town, a planned market? Yeah, they, they, uh, it was obvious that they saw the, the plot uh, of the, the town, so it seemed very organized with the streets and... With so it's, pathways yeah, and fences. pathways, and fences. These seem to be buildings with uh, gables which open out onto the beach close to the side of the lake and people and doors in those so people go out to the waterfront where there are a number of jetties going out into the water. One historian has referred to the Viking Age as the golden age of the pig farmer because most people never did anything and never went anywhere and they stayed at home. Finding that daily life the people who underpinned all the people with pretensions to glory and big ships. That is one of the great challenges of archaeology. At the Museum of Cultural History in Oslo, tens of thousands of artifacts found in Kaupang form the basis for a living history of the early Viking way of life. What I like about objects is that they're part of a sort of a non-verbal communication the way that they tell other people who they are, what they want to do, how they exert authority over people. And artifacts give us an insight into that, which is often missed by the historical record. Oh, yeah, so what are these? Some simple, cheap jewelry yeah. that a lot of people could afford. So this is the sort of, the, the, the real sort of everyday, every man kind of, yeah, kind of approach. Really. This would be the Scandinavian type of pottery. Then if we look at where the charring marks are, yeah. that could tell us whether it's sat in the coals or mm. over the top, mm. which would tell us about different ways of cooking. Right, so we come to now to another sort of complicated manufacturing method which produces hair combs. It's made up of deer antler and then riveted together with iron rivets and then very ornately decorated afterwards with, with intricate designs. These teeth actually don't actually really look like they're being cut for purpose. They just look to, they're just there to look fancy. So I think that there's a possibility this is a kind of status tool. It's like a designer watch. One of the most common ways of looking at the Viking Age is, is as seeing it as something alien, something very different to what we think about life today. But there are elements of life which go on which would be familiar to us as well. They made things, had to eat, they had to cook tend the fields, bring families up. People are people in the Viking Age. And these are spindle wells that go on the bottom of the spindle for when you're spinning yarn. Okay. And what type of textile do they really want and uh, need in the early Viking Age? They want sails. Yes. <laughs> sails, the linchpin to the Viking's mastery of the seas. The development of the revolutionary Viking longship gives the Norsemen an advantage over everyone in the Middle Ages. The age of raiding is on the horizon. A working reconstruction of a Viking ship called the Gokstad is owned by the museum in Borg, Norway. Okay, we have to row. It's no wind now, so we have to row a little bit. Okay. Row. Come on, team. Go on. Let's do it. Uh, not that direction, oh. the other direction. I would be the worst Viking ever, just... <laughs> uh, <laughs> Actress Maud Hurst, who plays Helga, the wife of Floki on Vikings, has come to Norway to experience life on the water, Viking style. 
have not used arms like this. We use the back. Use the back of okay. the body. The back into it, guys. Body. You have to move. More to the back. More to the back. Stop it to force. Come on. <laughs> More back. Like this. Oh. And... <laughs> okay, here we go. Uh, what was it in particular about Vikings? That why, did, why were they so intrigued about sailing and raiding and finding new places? It's important to ask how much of a maritime culture Scandinavia mm -hmm. is. Everybody, in, in some way or another, has a relationship to the sea. Mm -hmm. And when they start to really expand out of Scandinavia, it's kind of an extension of that. They just go a little bit further. Um, I think it's a lot to do with the development of towns. That as we start to see towns developing around Scandinavia, then you want to go a bit further to get that your, your nice bit of jewellery to sell your wares. It's important to, to understand that the Vikings were, were lots of different things at different times. So there were very few kind of professional raiders or yeah. professional farmers, people adapted to changing circumstances. It's not even that there are farmers over here and raiders over here. In many cases, they're the same people. There was an absolute explosion sometime in, in the 8th century, 9th century, of these raiding parties uh, appearing out of uh, Scandinavia. And the story itself involved cultural, military, social growth. This was a dynamic period which actually changed Europe. But it started from these little islands. One of the things that changes around the Viking Age is there's an increased access to possible wealth. People start to go out of Scandinavia to find this stuff. With vast plunder pouring into Scandinavia, the lives of the Vikings are radically changing. The golden age of the Norsemen sets sail. At the beginning of the ninth century, the Vikings are cutting a swath across Europe. <laughs> the Museum of Cultural History in Oslo has a stunning array of looted goods that tell the story of the fundamental changes taking place in Viking society. We have stories in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle about the raiding of monasteries, but to actually see the evidence, and it really sort of brings it to life. Is this the sort of thing that would have been brought back from overseas, do you think? Or is this a, a sort of thing that would be made in Scandinavia? Well, uh, there are uh, produced swords in Scandinavia in the Viking Age, but from the shape of the handle, uh, it probably is brought back uh, from, uh, from the British Isle. So this is as Viking as it gets. This is uh, an object which has been taken from a monastery in the British Isles. It's been turned into a piece of jewelry for showing off and displaying status and power. We have these pieces here. Uh, they're all mountings from a sword belt. A sword belt has been converted into jewelry. Evidence of gift giving in Viking culture. At the top. Wait, wait, what's that? It's women's names oh. carved into the backside of the objects. Okay. Yes. So it's been uh, attached by writing to the person. Someone's laying claim to this object. Yep, absolutely. They could have melted all this stuff down if they wanted to, but they didn't. And we know that there's a certain amount of power that can be won by referring to your great adventures overseas. If you can demonstrate your power, giving out these objects, that allows you to build a stronger and stronger political base. Viking chieftains are growing in wealth and stature. High above the Arctic Circle is the historic settlement of Bork, or stronghold in English. Look at this! Never-ending Today, actress Maud Hurst is on a voyage to learn more about how the Vikings and their leaders really lived. Borg is a village under the rule of a Viking chieftain in the 9th century. The remains of half a dozen massive boathouses and their untold secrets have rested undisturbed for more than a thousand years. So what exactly are we looking at? Well, this is the, the space where a Viking boat would have been pulled up from the lake and housed over the winter. So on these earthen banks that we've got here, basically a, a long, thin wooden house with a boat inside. Kind of similar to what 
like nowadays boat has. But Absolutely. Like, yeah. And how big is it? We can find out. Shall we? Uh, shall we pace it? I think I'm at the end. Wow. Well, that's pretty big. This is the sort of thing that would have housed the boats that came in for anyone who's coming to visit Borg. Would these boats have been able to get to England and, and travel that far? Or? Yeah, I don't think there's any reason to think not. Awesome. This is uh, it's pretty amazing. At the Lofoter Viking Museum in Borg, there are exceptionally rare objects that tell of a rich culture. This is amazing. Is, this, is it gold leaf or is it an actual piece of... No, it's a, it's a very thin foil of gold and it's been stamped with a pattern. It's lots of different ones and we're starting to get the idea that maybe each high status settlement has its own design, almost like a, a kind of business card. Hmm, interesting. And what about this gold? Of all the wonderful things at Borg, this is the one that we can be reasonably sure has come here as loot. Probably the best guess is this is a sort of a pointer for using with manuscripts, something which we know about from Anglo-Saxon England in particular. Somebody went to the British Isles and brought this back in their pocket. In all of Scandinavia, this is the only object like this. It's beautiful. It's amazing how such a small object can say such a big story and tell us so much about the history. But Borg is more than just a museum at the edge of the Viking world. High above the Arctic Circle, the Great Hall of the Vikings reaches to the gods. More than just a community, Borg was also home to a remarkable feature that defined the very essence of Viking society, the Great Hall. And in the pantheon of Great Halls, Borgs would have been the greatest. The culmination of 300 years of Viking pillaging and culture. Wooden markers indicate where the actual posts of the Great Hall once stood. This would have been home to the chieftain at Borg. It is the largest Viking building ever discovered in all of Scandinavia. It really is just a perfect location for a hall. You've got access to water down there. You've got good arable land up here. This is something you don't get from a, an excavation plan, do you? No, it's, no, it's fantastic. It's very, very clear. No wonder the chieftain felt powerful being in this yeah. place. And as we come in, this is a sort of classic entranceway space. Yeah, you can see the aisles of posts support the roof, and you can see them stretching away. We're only about what, a third of the way in yeah. to the hall. This is like 80 meters long, I think. It's yeah, really 83. Way yeah. bigger than I thought. And is, I mean, it's such a huge space. How many people would have lived in here? Just the chieftain and his family, or would there have been other people here? That's one of the big questions here, isn't it? Because it, it's too big for a single residence. Mm. This isn't, you know, a nuclear family rattling about in one end. Presumably, their servants are living in here as well, perhaps their extended family, or perhaps even several families. It's just so big, it's, it's a vast structure. And we can see that, can't we, in the kind of activities that are happening here as well. There all seems to be all sorts of crafts taking place. There are people weaving, there's people sat at the fire doing different crafts, there's cooking going on, um, as well as all the various sort of high status activities. So it's a kind of a, a very sort of multi-purpose space in many ways, um, but a, at the same time, a very monumental space. The museum has reconstructed to scale what the Chieftain's Great Hall might once have looked like. I unexpectedly feel very at home in here. I think maybe the uh, art department must have come and done research because it feels exactly how the Great Hall in our show feels. Do you think this is how it actually would have been? I think so, certainly. Everything that we see here is based on archaeological evidence or on images or on written descriptions. So there's nothing here that's, that's out of place. It's also a place that enshrines the hierarchies of the Viking Age. There's often an idea that the, the time of the Vikings was very egalitarian, and, and to some degree it was, but it's also strictly hierarchical. We do have quite a strict sort of hierarchy and political structure, but also in some ways it's quite weak, and it is possible for people to shift around and change positions through doing particular things. Just as in the series, right at the beginning, in the first season, this is where Ragnar starts on his journey from a prominent farmer eventually to a king mm -hmm. by speaking up and challenging the order in the hall. 
Do you think the Vikings deserve the bad reputation they've had over the years? Do you think in the show that we're, we're playing villains? If you ask their victims, which is the, the perspective we've always had, the answer is absolutely yes. And they did do very bad things. But if you look at the Vikings from their point of view, as they saw the world, then something very different emerges. They're people living their lives, making their choices, trying to get by, just like everybody else. <laughs> the key thing that we've discovered about the Vikings, I sum it up in one word, and that's sophistication. These are not barbarians at all. Their poetry, their view of the world, their understanding of each other and of human life is as complex, as rich, and in its own curious way, as beautiful as that of any other people. Thank you guys so much for bringing me here and for showing me some amazing, amazing scenery. And I've seen the world that the Vikings saw, which uh, I don't think many people can say they have. And it's changed my view completely of, uh, of what Vikings were about. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Skull. Skull. Skull.